I don't see any new questions coming on, so I will begin. Again, my name is John Abraham Powell. Everybody who knows me calls me Abe. I'm the executive director of the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade, and this is a webinar on neighborhood cooperation in a pandemic. It is March 16th, 2020 at 6.05 p.m. The mission of the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade is to prepare for and respond to natural disasters and community crises through volunteer training, coordination, and deployment. We were founded after the 1-9-2018 debris flow in Montecito, California, and we have been deploying, training, and working with volunteers uh, ever since. Our vision is a global network of resilient neighborhoods working together to address the challenges of climate change at the local level. We believe in local solutions that are networked for broader impact, um, and we focus on getting it done uh, in neighborhoods all around Santa Barbara County in 2020. The wisdom of the Bucket Brigade comes from decades of community organizing in Santa Barbara County. Um, much of the things that we have learned were given to us by elders uh, in different neighborhoods in Santa Barbara County, including the Mountain Drive community, Painted Cave, Eucalyptus Hill, Mission Canyon, East Side, West Side, Riviera. Um, there's a tremendous uh, community wisdom uh, here from living in Santa Barbara and going through the various disasters we've faced over the years. And the Bucket Brigade has done its our best to collect that wisdom, to preserve it, and to make it into a shareable format uh, that we can uh, share with people all around the community in Santa Barbara County and beyond. So the fundamentals of our community resilience wisdom uh, is this. Number one, a caring, cooperative, and organized community is the fundamental building block of resilience. Local knowledge empowers every aspect of resilience, including preparation, planning, relief, and recovery efforts, and that local knowledge makes all of those efforts more efficient and effective. Swift, collaborative, and perhaps most importantly, sustained action is what is required for true recovery and resilience from any natural disaster or community crisis. So uh, what is local resilience? Why local resilience? Um, according to a great friend of ours at FEMA, David Fukutomi, the local response capacity is the absolute foundation of all disaster relief. Um, the ability for the boots on the ground at the grassroots to deliver service uh, is the foundation in which all the other services are going to ultimately rest. What does response capacity look like uh, with the Bucket Brigade? Um, it's neighbors safely helping each other in a time of need. There are many different ways to do that from helping after a debris flow to helping neighbors prepare for wildfire or flooding um, learning how to do first aid or CPR to help each other, um, or helping out in a pandemic. Um, local response capacity in the Bucket Brigade looks like all of us working together, inclusive, and that is one of the most important aspects of the Santa Barbara Bucket Brigade is that we are an inclusive organization. We are cooperated, cooperative, and we believe in coordinated action. So inclusive means people of all ages, races, colors, genders, sexual orientations, religions, physical and mental abilities, political parties, we don't care. Everyone is welcome to participate because there are all kinds of people in your neighborhood and to really build resilience, we need to include all of them, welcome them and find out how we can help each other by working together. Okay, but you all came here to learn what can an organized neighbor neighborhood do to help each other during a pandemic? How can we help each other? That is the question this evening, and I think it's time to get right into that. So let's do it. Now, to begin with, we're gonna focus on a couple areas in the following order. Uh, we're gonna talk about neighborhood cooperation um, during this pandemic and any pandemic. Um, and of course, number one, safety first. Do not do anything that you do not feel safe doing. If you don't feel safe, 
You shouldn't do it. We're going to start with that. We're going to end with that. Within that framework, uh, we're going to talk about all the possibilities. Um, we are first going to talk about proper resources for public health information. There's a lot of information out there on social media and other places that is inaccurate, misleading, or worse. And we are going to only use public health information in our presentations and outreach. Um, and we think you should too. Um, we are going to talk about resources for assistance during this crisis, whether that's medical resources, financial resources, food resources. All of these things may be needed by you or others around you during the crisis. Um, four, neighborhood organizing for safety and cooperation. This is a scary time. Um, it's much better to have people around you who care and want to organize to keep everyone safe and to cooperate. Um, to do that, you need good communication. We're going to talk about neighborhood communication and how to establish it if you don't have it and how to use it if you do. Then we're going to talk about ways to help each other and we are going to review additional resources that are available to neighborhoods. Okay, safety first. How do we stay safe? What we're going to talk about now is how to protect yourself and your family because if you aren't safe, you cannot help anyone. If you get sick, you are immediately out of the game. Um, if your family gets sick, you're not going to be able to help others because you're going to be focusing on your family and you are going to be self-quarantining at that point. So it is fundamentally important to observe the safety protocols that have been established by the CDC, state of California, as well as this county of Santa Barbara. How do I protect myself in a pandemic? We're going to talk about that. How do I protect my family? Just as important. How can I safely help others within that context? Okay, so I am now going to provide information that you can find on the CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control website. And I pr provided a link here on this slide um, that is where all this information uh, is available to you directly. Um, but the first thing is understand the disease and how it spreads. So um, there is no current vaccine available for the coronavirus disease. The best way to prevent illness is to avoid being exposed to the virus. The virus is thought to spread from person to person and primarily by close contact with one another or through respiratory droplets, uh, fluids, body fluids, when an infected person coughs or sneezes. Um, these fluids can get on surfaces, they can get on you, and then they can cause infection, which is what we're trying to avoid. So first thing, you've heard this a million times, but I'm going to say it again, washing hands is fundamental. And when you've washed your hands, something a lot of people do is immediately touch something else that may or may not be contaminated, like your pants, your jacket, uh, uh, a table, a chair. So you need to think about when you're out in the world, if you are out in the world, what you've touched since you washed your hands uh, and bring awareness to that. It is incredibly important and try to avoid touching your nose, eyes, and mouth as hard as it, hard as it is. You need to try to do that. Um, avoid close contact. Um, the, the CDC is recommending six feet of space between people at this point. Put distance in yourself between you and others um, to avoid spreading the disease or catching the disease from others. Obviously, in your home, this isn't always going to be possible or possible at all. But uh, when you're out in the world, this is absolutely critical. If you're home, stay sick. If you're sick and you go out in the world, you can get other people sick. That's not a good idea for you or anyone else. Um, cover your coughs and sneezes. That's basic. We're going back to basics here. After you do that, wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Um, very important. A face mask. When to use a face mask? A lot of people have talked about the face mask shortage. People are hoarding face masks. This is uh, really unfortunate. Um, if you are not sick, you do not need to wear a face mask unless you are caring for someone who is sick. Um, this is really important. We need to save them for when they are urgently needed. They are needed by people who are sick and the people who are caring for them. That is when we use face masks. Um, and when you use a face mask, is it imperative that you get one that fits and that uh, you put on properly? Um, cleaning and disinfecting surfaces, frequently touched surfaces, doorknobs, other things. Um, very important. There's information on these links here that will help you learn how to do that properly. Um, now, 
family planning in an emergency. During an outbreak, um, you want to protect yourself and others by staying home from work or school if you can. Some people can't, but if you can, uh, stay home. Uh, the safest place uh, is in your home uh, as opposed to out in the world. Stay away from other people, obviously, that are sick and limit contact as much as you can safely and feasibly. The next step is to create a household plan of action. If you all know your household plan, you are going to be in much better shape moving forward. And, you know, as we're thinking about our preparedness and our safety, we need to take care of ourselves and then we need to take care of our families and then think outward from there. Um, plan ways to care for people who might be at great risk for serious complications. If you have elderly people or people with pre-existing conditions that will make them vulnerable or more vulnerable to the coronavirus, think about how you will uh, get them care if they need it. Get to know your neighbors. This is from the CDC. We didn't just make this up. Talk with your neighbors about planning safely. Uh, if you have a website or a neighborhood group or a social media page, join it. Uh, get in communication with your neighbors early, often, and stay in communication throughout this crisis. Um, identify the aid organizations in your community that provide services uh, and goods that might be needed during this crisis. Um, we're going to talk about some of those in this presentation. Create an emergency contact list for everyone in your family. Stay informed. Get up-to-date information from only public health sources, not from social media. Um, and stay home again if you're sick. Um, once the, the disaster, I mean, once uh, uh, you go into quarantine, you need to practice everyday preventive actions throughout the crisis. Um, if someone gets sick in your house, try to put them in a separate room with a separate bathroom, if at all possible. If you can't do that, you can't do that. But then you're going to want to clean surfaces and be as careful as you can to try to prevent everyone else from getting sick. Stay in touch with other people by phone or email. Don't get isolated. Um, if you get sick and you're isolated, that's a very dangerous situation. Um, and then also remember to, to remember the emotional health of your household members. This is going to be really stressful for kids, stressful for grown-ups, stressful for the elderly, and we need to be gentle with each other and keep checking in to make sure people are doing okay. Okay. Um, now that we have uh, uh, an outbreak uh, here locally in California, the schools have closed. It is also important to discourage children and teens from gathering in public places uh, while school is out. If they are out there at the playground, um, they could be spreading the virus or contracting it and then bringing it back home to you. So think about what your kids are doing during this crisis and try to prevent them from coming into contact with coronavirus. Um, now we're going to talk about the public health resources. So I talked a little bit about this before. It is so important to use the public health resources that are designed to give you accurate information only. Um, those resources are here on this page, which uh, locally is the County Public Health Department of Santa Barbara County. Um, statewide, we have the California Department of Public Health. You can click on that link uh, underneath uh, the state link there um, and get in touch with that information. And then all of the fact sheets that are an information uh, used in this presentation comes from the Centers for Disease Control. And uh, by clicking that link, it'll take you right to all of the fact sheets and information about coronavirus. All right, next steps. Neighborhood cooperation in a pandemic. Once you've gotten yourself organized and feel comfortable with your level of safety and your family, if you have a family organized and feel comfortable with your family plan and safety practice, um, we encourage you to get into communication with your neighbors and to maintain communication as much as possible throughout the pandemic. So the things we're going to cover now, neighborhood organizing for public for safety and cooperation proper communication for cooperation, and ways to help each other. Moving right into that, um, we are going to talk about neighborhood organization. So the first question is, is your neighborhood already organized? Is there a homeowners association or neighborhood group? Um, search the web. Ask around if you don't know. If you live on Eucalyptus Hill or the Riviera or Mountain Drive or Montecito, 
um, or a number of other neighborhoods in town. They have existing neighborhood groups um, that are already established and have elected leaders and bylaws, and those are all good things. So if you have a group in your area, reach out to them. Ask them if they are organizing around emergency communication. If not, ask them if they would consider organizing um, and then try to work with that group to improve communication on your block and throughout the neighborhood. Okay, but what if your neighborhood isn't organized and there is no neighborhood group? Um, we have four options for you um, and you need to pick the option that feels safe for you. And I'm gonna repeat that early, often, and just about every time I bring this up. Pick an option that you feel safe engaging in. That is absolutely critical. So option A, um, if you don't have an organized neighborhood, you could invite your neighbors into, neighbors into a neighborhood email thread. My neighborhood did this uh, where I live. There was no uh, formal group that was taking care of that little neighborhood. And so a couple of uh, nice ladies down the street took it upon themselves to ask us if we wanted to be in the, the email thread. They sent us a letter and said, would you like to come in uh, to our email thread and, and be in communication with us? And people who wanted to opted in. Um, they hand delivered those letters to our mailboxes. We got those and then we opted in to the email or not. It's totally voluntary and that's good. Um, and then you get people who want to be in there um, uh, in there, and people who don't want to be don't have to be. That's It's really important, it, it, just if you want to do this. Um, I have a sample letter here that you could send to your neighbors. This is just an example of letting them know uh, why you're connecting with them, um, who you are. Um, you don't, don't give them your address uh, if you don't feel safe about that. Obviously, you don't have to provide a lot of information, but you can give your name. Um, you're going to give them your email. Um, you're going to tell them why you're reaching out to them and invite them to participate. Um, this is just an example of how to do this, but um, you know there are other ones, uh, and we're going to talk about more of them now. Okay, so the next thing, sorry about that. Um, so if, if you don't feel safe doing that, I don't want to you know, give anybody my direct information in my neighborhood. I don't know them well enough. I'm not comfortable. I don't feel safe. Then don't do it. Stop. Uh, alternatives. What's another alternative? Uh, you could st start a Facebook group. Uh, for your block, you can make a private Facebook group and invite anyone, any one person or two people that you already know in your neighborhood to join the group and ask them to join others. Um, that's a simple, uh, non-invasive way for people to join in and start sharing information. Um, do it yourself. Option C, uh, communicate with people on Nextdoor and invite them to communicate in your neighborhood. It's another great way to share information. Um, uh, and option four, um, if none of those feel right, uh, maybe you could find one neighbor in your neighborhood that you feel safe contacting and communicating with and just get their email and communicate with them because even one person in your neighborhood group is better than nobody. Uh, and so uh, that's four options. Um, each one has pros and cons, but those are all way of getting, ways of getting started. Okay, once your neighborhood is organized, uh, as many neighborhoods are, what's next? Um, the important thing is to send out an email connecting the group around this pandemic. Uh, make sure that they understand that your group it wants to maintain neighborhood communication throughout the pandemic and to invite all neighbors within that community to participate in it and, and to check in. Um, we suggest checking in once a week, um, at least at this point. Uh, just uh, make sure people are okay, send out an email, um, letting people know that if they need help uh, or they need services, um, to be in communication. If possible, it is best to have a neighborhood uh, coordinator who is facilitating these communications. And it is also important to have a backup person for that neighborhood coordinator in case they get sick. Um, all right, now, once you've got that email out, inviting people to cooperate and to uh, be a part of your group, um, it's important to share uh, information with them and it is important to share uh, vetted information with them. So the resource pages that are in this presentation 
are a good start because the information we're providing is from public agencies and we're sticking to that. Um, especially encourage self-quarantined people to stay in contact um, with a trusted neighbor or friend uh, if they have one. The reason for this is the high-risk community, which is the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions, have been asked to self-quarantine, which is incredibly isolating. They are in a very vulnerable position and uh, they may have caretakers and they may not. They may need, may need help and they may not have access to it. And so by reaching out to them you and getting in communication with them, you are providing a life-saving service. You are a lifeline to people who are self-quarantined because they may need your help tomorrow or the next day or at any point during this crisis. Make sure they know how to get in touch with you. Um, some people have access to email. Some people don't. Remember that some people don't have access to email. And if you know someone and feel comfortable with them, comfortable giving them your phone number, then uh, that's a good way to do it, especially with the elderly. Once you have good communication, let's talk about the ways that we can help each other. Uh, obviously, sharing uh, public safety information and resources. So the resource pages and the public safety pages uh, at the end of this presentation are a good start. Um, there are other things that your group might want to present, but I urge you to be careful and to only provide vetted public health and safety information um, if you're going to provide that kind of information. Um, the next thing is to check and see who might be not included in your email list or your communication list. Um, you know, there might be, you might have half the neighbors on your block and you might start asking, hey, does you know that guy down the street? Do you, are there people we're missing? Can you ask them if they want to join and bring them in? And the goal is to be as inclusive as possible while respecting people's boundaries. Some people are not going to want to do this and that is their right and we don't want to force anybody, but we want to make sure they understand the invitation is open to them should they need help or should they change their mind. Okay. We've already talked about some of the ways to communicate, which is a private Facebook group. Uh, we've talked about uh, Nextdoor, um, the email list. Now I wanna talk about something that is probably going to be needed right away and has already been working in my neighborhood, which is shopping for neighbors. Um, this is an important way we can help each other right now, especially for people who are self-quarantined. If there are people who for health reasons in your neighborhood are not supposed to leave their home, they're gonna have a hell of a time shopping, right? But we, their neighbors, can help them safely if we do this carefully, because if you're already going shopping anyway, why not pick up uh, items for neighbors uh, while you're out there? So uh, let's talk about how we shop for neighbors. And this was taught to me by my neighbor, Delina, this week, who uh, just went right into action without being told, uh, contacted all the neighbors, she let us know she was going shopping. Thanks, Alina. She said uh, to text her um, uh, items that, that, that we might need, and we did. Um, pretty much everybody texted her toilet paper this week, um, and she found it. Uh, she's a genius. <laughs> um, uh, and then the best way to do this is if you get a list from different people and you go to the store and you get those goods for them, ring their goods up separately. The reason for this is um, you'll get a receipt for them so they'll know exactly how much it costed and there won't be any dispute over what the cost was. Um, if you bag all of their items separately and put their receipt in the bag, it will be very easy uh, to do this. Uh, and then you can drop that bagged item off on their doorstep. Um, and the important thing is don't go in, <laughs> you know, we don't want to touch each other. We're maintaining our six feet of separation the whole time as much as possible. And, uh, we can put those bags there with a receipt and then ask them for payment. They can pay you by Venmo, which is a great way to do it or PayPal, or if necessary, and they don't do that, which may be some people, they could put an envelope, uh, out with a check in it or cash written to you. Um, but you can work that out. Okay. Uh, let's focus specifically on the elderly uh, people during the coronavirus crisis. Uh, elderly people are the most vulnerable to the coronavirus, and chances are they're pretty scared. Um, everybody's scared, but the people who are most likely to get gravely ill from this are the most scared. 
um, and they're already supposed to be quarantined, so now they're isolated. Um, when you think about the elderly, um, some of them have email, but many don't. Uh, some of them don't even know about Facebook or wouldn't get on it if they had, and some elderly folks don't have a smartphone. They have a simple phone for making phone calls and maybe texting. Keep that in mind if you're doing outreach to people in your neighborhood. They might not be able to email and they might need a little bit of extra effort to communicate with them. The best pe people to communicate with them are trusted neighbors or family or friends. Um, those are the people they're going to want to talk to. They might be scared of other people and you need to be sensitive to that. Um, we don't want to scare anybody more. Um, and so sending a, a family member or a, a trusted neighbor um, is the best emissary to help get them into communication and keep them there. Um, and then last of all, once you get into communication, ask them how best to communicate with them. It's important to ask, is it going to be easier to uh, email? Uh, do you want a phone call? Do you want a text? Uh, what do you want? Um, how am I going to communicate with you best to keep you uh, in the loop here? Okay, so remember, let's review here. We've talked about um, safety. We've talked about individual safety, family safety. Um, we've talked about neighborhood organizing, communication, and ways to help each other. I'm sure there are a lot of ways to help each other that I have not talked about. Um, but we've talked about a couple fundamentals, and we will be talking about more uh, ways to help in days uh, and weeks to come with different webinars. But the most important thing at this point is to remember, stay calm, stay safe at all times. If you don't feel safe, then you need to rethink what you're doing. Stay in communication, don't get isolated. And the most important thing is that we stick together and we be ready to ask for help or give help uh, whenever we need it. And this is Santa Barbara. We've all seen some really hard times um, over the years, including that debris flow just two years ago. And we've shown that this is a community that will rise up and help each other in effective and powerful ways uh, in times of need. And we need to lean into that, all of us collectively together now, using the best information and techniques we have to get through this crisis um, together. So uh, that's the presentation. Our goal here is that our community gets better for everyone, no matter what comes next. Um, please join us uh, if you can. Uh, please go to our website to learn uh, more about what we're doing and to stay informed, to sign up to volunteer, or if you need help. All of those are available on our website. And now I'm going to do a quick run through of the resource pages here at the end. So uh, the end of this document, which is available as a download through this. Um, through this webinar uh, is here. So I have the local public health resources. You can click on those links to go right to, to, to public health information. Um, media resources. So these are the local media resources that offer free local news. Um, New York Times has made it free uh, information about the coronavirus outbreak as well that provides some international information. Um, financial resources. So uh, some people uh, live paycheck to paycheck, and this disaster is going to be very, very trying for them if they can't go to work. And so we want to make sure that people are aware of the, the financial resources to help people get through this crisis. Medi-Cal is an important one for health care. Um, we have a link here. Um, that's an important resource. Um, financial resources, uh, if you have loss of wages, uh, the EDD provides support. There's a link there. Um, there are small business loans through the Small Business Administration. Um, they can provide uh, loans and grants to businesses to get through this. Um, uh, 211 Utility Assistance, um, that's a place you can go to get uh, more information um, through uh, 211. Um, and then if you are experiencing difficulty with your mortgage, sorry, um, if you can't pay or having a hard time during this time, um, there are government programs that can help you, um, and there's a link there. Um, last of all, if you are in Santa Barbara County, the United Way of Santa Barbara County, as well as the Santa Barbara Foundation, have joined forces to provide financial support to families and individuals uh, at this time during the crisis, and there's a link here. 
This is an important piece of information for your neighborhoods. Um, you can go there to find out how you can get financial aid um, during this time. And a lot of people may need that all around you, or you may need that assistance. Okay, food assistance. Um, not everybody is going to be able to afford food or have access to food during this crisis, and there are resources available. Um, CalFresh is a program that helps low-income individuals get food, um, and there's online link to the application there and an, a phone number I've provided in this document. Food Bank of Santa Barbara um, is a huge food resource to the entire community, and they have a disaster feeding plan that they will be rolling out um, and I've provided a link to the food bank if you want to get in touch with them. The Organic Soup Kitchen is another amazing local resource um, that does meal delivery for people in need. Um, and they are uh, very helpful and their soup is absolutely delicious. Um, so um, if you know people or you need this help, um, definitely get in touch with them. They are a wonderful organization. Now, let's talk about access and functional needs people. Um, they are going to need uh, help just like many others. And um, the, one of the best resources for people with access and functional needs is the Independent Living Resource Center. Um, they are set up to help people who have uh, AFN and are living uh, independently and um, are there to provide information and assistance. Um, and so uh, here's um, some information about them and contact information. So um, if you have access and functional needs or you know someone who has access and functional needs, let's just make sure they know they are aware of the Independent Living Resource Center. They have the contact information and they have their emergency workbooks um, to use to help them prepare um, and to get help if they need it throughout the crisis. So that is my presentation. I want to thank all of you for joining me in this, and I'm going to go now to questions. Um, if there are any typed questions, I will try to answer them. Um, let's see. Handout questions. Um, Spanish version. So uh, here is a question. Um, will there be a Spanish speaking version of this? Yes, we are going to translate this entire presentation into Spanish tomorrow. We will uh, uh, present in Spanish tomorrow uh, at 6 p.m. And I'm sorry we didn't have that together today, but um, we've been scrambling to uh, get on top of this and prepare this information for you. But uh, everything moving forward will be in English and in Spanish. Um, they won't necessarily be at the same time, but we will definitely be uh, providing all of our information in both languages as we move forward. Um, and uh, let's go to the next question. Okay, there are some questions here about, you know, local capacity for testing and uh, hospital service and whatnot. And, and we don't have any information that you're not going to get from county public health on that. So, um, you know, we're not, we're not uh, imagining that we would ever take the place of county public health and we refer everyone to county public health for information about what's being done now for testing, what is being done uh, for treatment and how to proceed um, if you think you're sick. Um, all of that information is available there. Um, other questions? Let's see, uh, people in Ventura, um, they're wondering how to help uh, find uh, and help elderly and isolated people in their neighborhood. Um, I would check in with uh, organizations like the Independent Living Resource Center and others to um, find out what can be done and cooperate with the existing efforts from people whose job it is to help access and functional needs people. Okay, that is all the questions I have. So I'd like to thank you and remind you that this uh, webinar is uh, downloadable and especially that re resource guide at the back. Um, uh, you can download that here and uh, it will be on our Facebook page this evening as well. Um, thank you all, have a great day and um, please check in with santabarbaracketbrigade.org.